Welcome to our program uh, 1.6, Rising and Your Critical Role in Climate Change. We're in the studio of Drexel University's student-run WKDU 91.7 FM on the dial. I'm Diane Davis. I'm a doctoral student at uh, Drexel University. And I am your host and moderator for this uh, program segment series. And this is a public service program for the general listening audience. And this morning, we're talking to Dr. Hilton Omaguchi, who is a postdoctoral fellow with Dr. Mary Catherine Gonder's laboratory at Drexel University in the biology department. Dr. Omaguchi received his PhD from UCLA, Los Angeles in biology and has been specializing in researching the thermal adaptation of amphibians along gradients in the tropics. Welcome, Dr. Omaguchi, and thank you for joining us this, uh, this morning and our listening audience here in the WKDU studio. Uh, Dr. Hilton, when did you join the Gondor Laboratories at Drexel University's biology department? I have been at Drexel for about two years, right? And um, yeah, thanks for inviting me. <laughs> uh, we're glad to have you. Thank you for, for spending some time with us today in this very exciting research that you're doing. What have you been researching uh, on during this time? So basically, I'm interested in understanding diversification process in the tropics. And uh, I'm from Brazil, so I started working on diversification process along the gradient between Amazon and Brazilian savanna. And now I'm doing research in Africa, um, well, more specifically in Equatorial Guinea on Bioko Island that is about uh, 30 kilometers from the coast of Cameroon. And uh, basically, I'm studying amphibians along those gradients. Dr. Omaguchi, which amphibian species are you currently researching at Gondor Labs? I'm studying the golden puddle frog. The scientific name is uh, Phainobratacus auraidus. And uh, this species is broadly distributed in Central Africa. And the reason why I'm studying this frog is because, well, in Central Africa, we have um, a group of universities studying different species. And these, spe these species, the golden puddle frog, actually they are using as a model to understand the impact of climate change along the gradient between the savanna and the rainforest, right? And I am interested to understand uh, um, basically the impact of climate change along the elevation of gradient on Bioko Island. So I'm using this species as a model to understand uh, the impact of climate change and also how uh, speciation can occur in a very short distance, right? Uh, can you tell us what a hotspot is? I understand the Bioko Preservation Program is considered to be a hotspot in Cameroon. Hotspots are regions of uh, where you can find high numbers of endemic species and uh, endemic species means that, uh, you, that there are species that you can find only in that place in the world and nowhere else and, uh, and there is a publication from 2000 that defined those hotspots they are like about 25 hotspots and uh, basically are those places that you have high number of species endemic species and also are trapped by uh, humans right like from different kind of um, uh, impacts, right? Like human impacts. I understand there's an organization called IPCC. And can you tell us a little bit about this? Yes, this organization actually is the, is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And uh, well, was uh, started by actually United Nations a um, long time ago, I think probably more than 20 years ago. I think it was 1980 something. Mm -hmm. And uh, basically, it's now like the previous um, assessment report that was the fifth assessment report that was done in 2013. Um, the actually, the IPCC basically is a collection of um, reports from 
people that do research on climate. Mm -hmm. There are like more than 2,000 researchers from more than 150 countries that they get together to have a consensus of what's happening with the climate, right? And then they work on this assessment report. And uh, basically, are, those are scientists that get together from all these different countries and uh, they they make this report for us to know what's happening with uh, the climate in the world. We understand that you're going back to this Bioko Preservation Program uh, region in Cameroon and you're going to be studying a little bit more in depth this, this time. Can you tell us about that more in-depth approach to your research? Sure. So basically, actually, the Bioko is in Equatorial Guinea, right? That's um, uh, close to Cameroon. Mm -hmm. But um, on this island, there are like three main peaks, well, three volcanoes, right? One is the Pico Basile, the other one is the Gran Caldera, and the third one is the Pico Bial. And we have like a very steep gra uh, gradient, and uh, I am interested to understand the effects of these elevational uh, changes on um, this species of frog that I was mentioning before, that's the puddle, uh, the golden puddle frog, right? So basically, I am trying to understand the, the impacts of climate change on those amphibians by uh, doing some physiological uh, experiments. So basically, I'm looking at the thermal physiological tolerance of those frogs along this elevational gradient. At what elevation is the Gondor Lab uh, Bioko Research Group going to be working at the station? What what uh, elevation is that? So uh, we have a research station in so Bioko. Um, it's relatively like a small island that you can actually drive from north to south in about like one hour and a half, mm -hmm. and in the south part of the island we have the Gran Caldera de Luba Scientific Reserve, and in that reserve. We have a station that is about in 1400 meters of altitude that is in about 4,600 feet. Mm -hmm. Above sea level. About, above sea level, right. So will you be looking at all of the species uh, in this longitudinal section? Right, so along this elevational gradient, um, so this, this species, the golden puddle frog, has the distribution from sea level up to about 1400 meters. That's actually the station level, right? And um, um, I'm starting to use this species as a model to try to see the thermal tolerance range and from sea level to high level, right? like to uh, 1400 meters. And uh, the idea actually is to expand this um, this research using other species as a model. So, like the idea is to um, get collect some amphibians. Like in amphibians, when I say amphibians, we want to look at the adult phase and the the, the mm -hmm. larvae phase, right? Mm -hmm. And um, we start doing research on the driver ends, um, and the, the idea is actually to do. Uh, this type of thermal t tolerance assays in two species. We are also focusing on, on butterflies. So basically, we are trying to do these experiments in ectotherms, right? The ectotherms are those um, organisms that cannot thermoregulate by themselves. They have to use the environment to thermoregulate, basically. Uh, do you expect to find any new species uh, as you're uh, examining more in-depth this uh, longitudinal section? Right, so that's a good question. In the tropics, it's very easy actually to find a new species. So that region uh, on Bioko Island is not that well explored by scientists, mm -hmm. so it's very likely that we can find new species. I am not a, a taxonomist, that means that I, I am not working towards like describing new species, because well, I'm focusing on my, my research, looking at the thermal adaptation of those amphibians to uh, to this elevation of radiant rain. Mm -hmm. So, what do you do when you find a species that you're not sure it could be new? It 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 might not be new. What do you do? Do you bring it back with you? What do you? How do you approach? Uh, wow, we we might have found a new species here. Right. Uh, <laughs> 
it's so in the tropics there are tons of different species distributed in that region right sure so when i go there it's a lot of resources that we have to use to collect those species mm -hmm. and so basically when i go there i collect that species my target species but i also collect other ones right mm -hmm. and the ones that uh, i've never seen before what i do i collect a piece of the dna mm -hmm. i preserve that individual mm -hmm. and um, work on the, all the permits that i need to export like import to the us right and then we have the natural history museums where we have the curators mm -hmm. and those curators are specialized in recognizing all the different species they have a collections uh in in different museums that they can access and compare that preserved specimen with the ones that they have in the collection this is based on morphology right so basically they compare the morphology of those um those collections that they have and then they compare with these species that they have the specimens that they have and from there they can tell if they're from the same species or if they're new species if they suspect that it's a new species you take a piece of well that dna that they took usually uh, when i say dna sample is basically I take a piece of the leg muscle mm -hmm. right? and then they can sequence and compare that sequence with all their uh DNA database that they have and from there you can uh, work from the genetic level level and also from the morphological level to be able to make a conclusion if it's a new species or not. Tell us uh, Dr. Omaguchi why is it important to study the thermal tolerance of frogs in the longitudinal gradients? So basically we are looking at the spatial variation in temperature, right? Like in the bottom in the tropics is quite warm, but as you get higher, like in our field station is chilly. It's 1400 meters above, right. above sea level. You can feel the, the, the difference in temperature and the, the difference on average annual mean temperature is uh, the difference between high and the low is about six degrees Celsius. Mm -hmm. And, um, we are suspecting that the amphibians that live on the bottom or other species too, right? Like not the ectotherms in general, that they live on uh, in the sea level and the ones that are live in the field research area, right? And they might show like adaptations to this variation in temperature, right? So we suspected that like uh, um, in the lower elevation, probably they, they adapted to the warmer temperatures and uh, compared to the ones that in our higher elevation, they, they, well, they are in a colder environment and uh, we suspect that they match the thermal tolerance according to the habitat that they, they, they uh, live in, right? Okay, so what is the elevation um, throughout the longitudinal gradients tell you about other types of species such as the ants and the butterflies? I mean, the ants uh, cannot go to the higher uh, ele uh, elevations, am I correct? And the butterflies, uh, how do they adapt? <laughs> so that's a good question. We are trying to get models, species actually, when I say models, we are trying to use those species that they actually the occur in the, along the whole gradient, right? Like, so uh, the idea is to collect the data on the species that have distribution along the whole gradient. So um, basically the idea is to compare the same species um, of butterflies or ants, the driver ants, right? Like, uh, from from low elevation and compare with the ones that inhabit the high elevation right so the idea is to do this uh, thermophysiological uh, assays so like the experiments and uh, not only that we collect a piece of the dna right um, we collect a dna sample and from that sample we see if there is any indication that they are becoming different like the populations from the bottom mm -hmm. and the, the high altitude are, are, are diverging basically right dr omoguchi how do you test the new species uh specimen that you might find uh in order to know whether this species may survive the additional greenhouse gas uh impact on the bioko preservation 
reserve in this longitudinal uh, section that you're examining mm -hmm. um, in its ability to adapt to the higher temperatures of climate change? Well, it's a hard question, right? We don't know. So the things that like we, first we need to describe these species, that describe, that species hasn't even been described yet, right? Yes. And uh, second, we need to know like a natural, uh, the natural history of that species, right? And then we need to do those exp experimental, uh, those physiological experiments and then start like drawing conclusions of the climate in that re region, right? So basically the IPCC, they give projections of this broad scale, like what's, how the temperature is going to change in the whole world. But when you get to the local level, mm -hmm. it's hard to make a prediction of how the climate is going to change in that micro level, right? Like in that, in that scale. And uh, in addition to that, like those kind of projections cannot predict how the micro habitat's gonna vary. So there is a disconnection between the micro macro climate and mm -hmm. the, the micro climate. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, that basically the micro climate is the climate that the, the species, the organism experience, right? So if we collect a new species, we need to know where they are inhabiting. We need to understand the micro habitat, look at the, uh, the, the heterogeneity in that micro habitat. And then we can start like making conclusions. So basically we need people on the ground doing this kind of research. It's kind of hard to predict just uh, with remote sensing data. Right? I see. So you are planning another trip very shortly. You're going to be leaving um, Philadelphia and the Gondor Labs to go and do more research at Bioko. And uh, you're going to be examining this um, a, a more um, inclusive longitudinal section of species that would be between sea level and 1400 meters uh, above uh, sea level in the Bioko Reserve. Right. I travel into Bioko on November 5th and uh, the goal of this, these uh, expeditions basically one, we have the DSA students, the Drexel student abroad. Mm -hmm that uh, they're gonna join to this research oh great and that they're gonna be engaged in basically looking at the effects of climate change on those uh, target species that i mentioned before and uh, the the other goal of this study basically is to start mapping the micro habitat uh, variation that we have on the island so i'm carrying with me those um, small data loggers mm -hmm. and the basically is to look at the, on the ground or like on the local level the habitat heterogeneity that we have in uh, sea level and uh, 1400 meters so you'll have it like in gis in layers and w which species you're finding where and uh, approximately what their health is mm -hmm. in accordance with the habitat itself uh, between your trip in February, I believe you told me you were there last February, this past February, do you expect to see any type of further degradation uh, in the habitat? Oh, it's a good question. So basically there are a lot of factors that can impact those mm -hmm. uh, communities. Mm -hmm. right? like, oh, oh, oh. One climate change. Climate change is like a slow process that we cannot see and it, that's why it's hard to believe that's happening, right? Mm -hmm. um, the other factor is that uh, we have a tiny island with, um, I don't know, like about 400,000 people living on that mm -hmm. island. And uh, there are a lot of um, human pressure like uh, on that island. So basically there's a hunting pressure, there is deforestation. There are a lot of factors that contribute to degradation of that mm -hmm. habitat, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, in the span of like few months, it's hard to detect. Uh, so basically, I am focusing on climate change. But of course, that's a, from remote sensing, we can detect the degradation of habitat over time. 
Um, but uh, that's not the focus of my research. My my research is going to be more focusing on mapping those microhabitat variation, right? And try to compare actually those um, microhabitat with what we get from the remote sensing from GIS data and see if there is a, a lot of discrepancy between these two type of, type of data set. Dr. Omaguchi, we've heard your scientific evidence and that there is definitely climate change going on and the uh, species such as the golden puddle frog is very much under uh, uh, attack uh, from climate change as well as these other factors in the Bioko uh, research program area. Can you tell us uh, what we can do um, as free-thinking, self-governed people of the United States uh, and other democracies around the world uh, to ameliorate climate change? Uh, I mean, you've been studying this for a long time and um, devoting your entire uh, doctoral research to uh, climate change and uh, the, the, the impact that it is having on various species, especially amphibians. So we'd like to hear if you have um, anything to give us from being in the field and seeing these, uh, spe these species uh, under attack from climate change. It's a, uh, well, I do research on climate change and then now the question is like, what can I do to, to improve, like to actually to reduce the impacts of climate change in an individual level, right? What can I do? Well, or people can do, right? Like in the US. Collectively, yes. What yes. can we do? From the individual level is to be aware that, yes, we, call, we are causing impact on this earth. It is human activity. Yes. And uh, basically changing our behavior of like using a more sustainable way of living, right? Like um, one, like, for instance, I bike to come to work and um, try to, I'm, I'm not vegetarian, but it's one thing that I can do to, to reduce my impact. Mm -hmm. And there are like several things that we need to be conscious in doing to, to reduce the impact of climate change. And then in that way, yes, if, if each individual has this attitude, we can like, as a group, make this world better, right? And uh, then also learning about uh, the effects of climate change, we also have to talk to politicians to uh, not just doing our part, but also coming from the top to the bottom to make change. Surely, we need to reduce our footprint, our carbon footprint, our methane uh, footprint mm -hmm. that very few people are talking about right now. We're going to be talking about the um, the carbon and the methane um, uh, footprint uh, later on in our series. Uh, Dr. Omagubuchi, thank you very much for uh, coming to uh, talk with us today. I know you're very busy and um, we'd like to have you back uh, when you come back to let us know what you have found in your research. I'm sure our listening audience would be uh, fascinated to learn what's been happening since you were there in February as uh, and what you're finding now uh, in your research, along with this new in-depth uh, longitudinal cross-section that you are uh, beginning to investigate and the possibility of any new species that you're going, you may find. Uh, we'd all love to hear about that. Thank you for coming. Thanks for inviting me. It was a pleasure to be here and for sure. Um, Anytime I can come back here and give updates about this research in Africa that we have been doing. Thank you.